Hi, this is Tim Pratt, Hugo Award-winning short story writer, and you're listening to Cast of Wonders. This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome. Episode 222 for December 4th, 2016. This week, we are very proud to present The George Business by Roger Zelazny, originally published in the October 1980 anthology Dragons of Light, edited by Orson Scott Card. Roger Joseph Zelazny, born May 13, 1937, who sadly passed June 14, 1995, was an American poet and writer of fantasy and science fiction short stories and novels, best known for the Chronicles of Amber. He won the Nebula Award three times out of a total of 14 nominations, and the Hugo Award six times, also out of 14 nominations, including two Hugos for novels, the serialized novel And Call Me Conrad in 1965, subsequently published under the title This Immortal the following year, which, by the way, was a tie with Frank Herbert's Dune, he won for the best novel again in 1967 for his arguably other best-known work, Lord of Light. Special thanks to his son, executor, and damn fine author in his own right, Trent Zelazny, for allowing us rights to this story. This full cast production is brought to you by the narrator trio of Wilson Fowley, Phil Lunt, and Cheyenne Wright. Wilson Fowley has been reading stories out loud since the age of four, and credits any talent he has in this area to his parents, who are both excellent at reading aloud. He started narrating stories for more than just his own family in late 2008, when he answered a call for readers on the Podcastle forum. Since then, he's gone on to become Podcastle's most prolific narrator, reading or appearing in nearly 30 episodes. He's also narrated for many other podcasts. He's a proud owner of the escape artist's Hat Trick, having narrated for all four shows, in addition to Starship Sofa, Beam Me Up, Cast Macabre, Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, and the Journey Into podcast. He fits in all this narrating between his day job as a web developer in Vancouver, Canada, and being the director of a community show chorus called the Maple Leaf Singers. Hailing from the rain-sodden northwestern wastelands of England, Phil Lunt has dabbled in many an arcane vocation. From rock star to conveyor belt scraper at a bread factory, milkman to world's worst waiter. He's currently a freelance designer, actor, and sometimes writer-slash-editor, not to mention impending father. For his sins, he's chair of the British Fantasy Society, a role that can be more complicated than herding cats at times. He's still considering becoming an astronaut when he grows up, and you can follow him on Twitter. Cheyenne Wright is a freelance illustrator of many fine tabletop projects like the Deadlands Noir RPG, the Professor Elemental Card Game, as well as being the color artist on the Hugo Award-winning graphic novel series Girl Genius by Phil and Kaya Folio. He is not the lord of a subterranean colony of mole people bent on world subjugation. Such claims are libelous and unfounded, as is the ground beneath those who repeat them. You have been warned, sun-sucking dirt walkers. More info about Cheyenne's current plans for a better world, all of them, better worlds, can be found at arcanetimes.com. And now, we've a tale to tell. The George Business by Roger Zelazny Deep in his lair, Dart twisted his golden length about his small hoard, 
his sleep troubled by dreams of a series of identical armored assailants. Since Dragon's dreams are always prophetic, he woke with a shudder, cleared his throat to the point of sufficient illumination <coughs> to check the state of his treasure, stretched, yawned, and set forth up the tunnel to consider the strength of the opposition. If it was too great, he would simply flee, he decided. The hell with the horde. It wouldn't be the first time. As he peered from the cave mouth, he beheld a single knight in mismatched armor atop a tired-looking gray horse, just rounding the bend. His lance was not even couched, but still pointing skyward. Assuring himself that the man was unaccompanied, he roared and slithered forth. Hold. You who are about to fry. The knight obliged. Uh, you're just the one I came to see. I have... Why do you want to start this business up again? Do you realize how long it has been since a knight and a dragon have done battle? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, quite a while, but I... It is almost invariably fatal to one of the parties concerned, usually your side. Don't I know it? Uh, look, you've got me wrong. I dreamt a dragon dream of a young man named George, with whom I must do battle. You bear him an extremely close resemblance. I can explain. It's not as bad as it looks. You see... Is your name George? Well, yes, but don't let that bother you. It does bother me. You want my pitiful horn. It wouldn't keep you in beer money for a season. Hardly worth the risk. I'm not after your hoard. I haven't grabbed off a virgin in centuries. They're usually old and tough anyhow. Not to mention, hard to find. No one's accusing you. As for cattle, I always go a great distance. I've gone out of my way, you might say, to avoid getting a bad name for my own territory. I know you're no real threat here. I've researched it quite carefully. And do you think that armor will really protect you when I exhale my deepest, hottest flames? Hell no. So don't do it, huh? If you'd please. And that lance. You're not even holding it properly. George lowered the lance. On that, you are correct. Uh, but it happens to be tipped with one of the deadliest poisons known to the apothecary. I say, that's hardly sporting. I know. But even if you incinerate me, I'll bet I can scratch you before I go. No, that would be rather silly. Both of us dying like that, wouldn't it? Dart observed, edging away. It would serve no useful purpose, I can see. I feel precisely the same way about it. Then why are we getting ready to fight? I have no desire whatsoever to fight with you. I'm afraid I don't understand. You said your name was George, and I had this dream. I can explain it. But the poisoned lance... Self-protection. To hold you off long enough to put a proposition to you. Dart's eyelids lowered slightly. What sort of proposition? I want to hire you. Hire me, whatever for. And what are you paying? Mind if I rest this lance a minute? No tricks. Go ahead. If you're talking gold... Your life is safe. George rested his lance and undid a pouch at his belt. He dipped his hand into it and withdrew a fistful of shining coins. He tossed them gently so that they clinked and shone in the morning light. You have my full attention. That's a good piece of change there. My life savings. All yours in return for a bit of business. 
What's the deal? George replaced the coins in his pouch and gestured. See that castle in the distance, two hills away? I've flown over it many times. In the tower to the west are the chambers of Rosalind, daughter of the Baron Morris. She is very dear to his heart, and I wish to wed her. There is a problem. Yes. She's attracted to big, brawny barbarian types, into which category I, alas, do not fall. In short, she doesn't like me. That is a problem. So, if I could pay you to crash in there and abduct her, to bear her off to some convenient and isolated place and wait for me, I'll come along, we'll fake a battle, I'll vanquish you, you fly away and I'll take her home. I am certain I will then appear sufficiently heroic in her eyes to rise from sixth to first position on her list of suitors. How does that sound to you? Dart sighed a long column of smoke. Human, I bear your kind no special fondness, particularly the armoured variety with lances. So I don't know why I'm telling you this. Well, I, I do know, actually, but never mind. I could manage it all right. But if you win the hand of the maid, do you know what's going to happen? The novelty of your deed will wear off after a time. And you know that there will be no encore. Give her a year. I'd say, and you'll catch her fooling around with one of those brawny barbarians she finds so attractive. And then you must either fight him and be slaughtered, or wear horns, as they say. George laughed. <laughs> it's nothing to me how she spends her free time. I've, I've a girlfriend in town myself. Dart's eyes widened. I'm afraid I don't understand. She's the old Baron's only offspring, and he's on his last legs. Well, why else do you think an uncomely wench like that would have six suitors? Why else would I gamble my life's savings to win her? I see. Yes, I can understand greed. I call it desire for security. Quite. In that case, forget my simple-minded advice. All right. Give me the gold and I'll do it. The first valley in those western mountains seems far enough from my home for our confrontation. I'll pay you half now and half on delivery. Agreed. Be sure to have the balance with you, though. And drop it during the scuffle. I'll return for it after you two have departed. Cheat me, and I'll repeat the performance with a different ending. The thought had already occurred to me. Now, we'd better practice a bit to make it look realistic. I'll rush at you with the lance, and whatever side she's standing on, I'll aim for it and pass you on the other. You raise that wing... Grab the lance and scream like hell. Blow a few flames around too. I'm going to see you scour the tip of that lance before we rehearse this. Uh, right. I'll release the lance while you're holding it next to you and rolling around. Then I'll dismount and rush toward you with my blade. I'll whack you with the flat of it again on the far side a few times. Then you bellow again and fly away. Just how sharp is that thing anyway? damn dull. It was my grandfather's. Hasn't been honed since he was a boy. And you can drop the money in the fight. Certainly. How does that sound? Not bad. I can have a few clusters of red berries under my wing, too. I'll squash them once the action gets going. Nice touch. Yes, do that, do that. Let's give it a quick rehearsal now and then get on with the real thing. And don't whack too hard. That afternoon, 
Rosalind of Maurice Manor was abducted by a green and gold dragon who crashed through the wall of her chamber and bore her off in the direction of the western mountains. Never fear, shouted her sixth-ranked suitor, who just happened to be riding by, to her aged father, who stood wringing his hands on a nearby balcony. I'll rescue her. And he rode off to the west. Coming into the valley where Rosalind stood, backed into a rocky cleft, guarded by the fuming beast of gold and green, George couched his lance. Release that maiden and face your doom! Dart bellowed, George rushed. The lance fell from his hands, and the dragon rolled upon the ground, spewing gouts of fire into the air. A red substance dribbled from beneath the thundering creature's left wing. Before Rosalind's wide eyes, George advanced and swung his blade several times. He cried as the monster stumbled to his feet and sprang into the air, dripping more red. It circled once and beat its way off toward the top of the mountain, then over it and away. Oh, George! Rosalind cried, and she was in his arms. Oh, George! He pressed her to him for a moment. I'll take you home now. That evening, as he was counting his gold, Dart heard the sound of two horses approaching his cave. He rushed up the tunnel and peered out. George, now mounted on a proud white stallion and leading the grey, wore a matched suit of bright armour. He was not smiling, however. Good evening. Good evening. What brings you back so soon? Things didn't turn out exactly as I'd anticipated. <laughs> you seem far better accounted. I'd say your fortunes had taken a turn. Oh, I recovered my expenses and came out a bit ahead. But that's all. I'm on my way out of town. Thought I'd stop by and tell you the end of the story. Good show you put on, though, by the way. It probably would have done the trick. But? She was married to one of the brawny barbarians this morning, in their family chapel. They were just getting ready for a wedding trip when you happened by. I'm awfully sorry. Well, it's the breaks. To add insult, though, her father dropped dead of a heart attack during the performance. My former competitor is now the new baron. He rewarded me with a new horse and armour, a gratuity and a scroll from the local scribe lauding me as a dragon slayer. Then he hinted rather strongly that the horse and my new reputation could take me far. Didn't like the way Rosalind was looking at me now that I'm a hero. That is a shame. Well, we tried. Yes. Uh, so I just stopped by to thank you and let you know how it all turned out. It would have been a good idea, if it had worked. You could hardly have seen such nuptials. You know, I've spent the entire day thinking about the affair. We did manage it awfully well. Oh, no doubt about that. It went beautifully. I was thinking, how would you like a chance to get your money back? What have you got in mind? Um... When I was advising you earlier that you might not be happy with the lady, I was trying to think about the situation in human terms. Your desire was entirely understandable to me otherwise. In fact, you think quite a bit like a dragon. Really? Yes, it's rather amazing, actually. Now, realizing that it only failed because of a fluke, your idea still has considerable merit. I'm afraid I don't follow you. There is um, a lovely lady of my own species, whom I have been singularly unsuccessful in impressing for a long while now. Actually, there are an unusual number of parallels in our situation. She has a large horde, huh? Extremely so. Older woman? 
among dragons, a few centuries this way or that are not so important. But she too has uh, other admirers and seems more attracted to the brash variety. Uh-huh. I begin to get the drift. You gave me some advice once. I'll return the favour. Some things are more important than hordes. Name one. My life. If I were to threaten her, she might do me in all by herself before you come into her rescue. No, no. She's a demure little thing. Anyway... It's all a matter of timing. I'll perch on a hilltop nearby. I'll show you where, and signal you when to begin your approach. Now, this time I have to win, of course. Here's how we'll work it. George sat on the white charger and divided his attention between the distant cave mouth and the crest of a high hill off to his left. After a time, a shining winged form flashed through the air and settled upon the hill. Moments later, it raised one bright wing. He lowered his visor, couched his lance, and started forward. When he came within hailing distance of the cave, he cried out, I know you're there, Megtag! I've come to destroy you and make off with your horde, you godless beast! Eater of children! This is your last day on earth! An enormous burnished head with cold green eyes emerged from the cave. Twenty feet of flame shot from its huge mouth and scorched the rock before it. George halted hastily. The beast looked twice the size of Dart and did not look in the least retiring. Its scales rattled like metal as it began to move forward. Perhaps I exaggerated, George began and heard the frantic flapping of giant veins overhead. As the creature advanced, he felt himself seized by the shoulders. He was borne aloft so rapidly that the scene below dwindled to toy size in a matter of moments. He saw his new steed bolt and flee rapidly back along the route they had followed. What the hell happened? I hadn't been around for a while. Didn't know that one of the others had moved in with her. You're lucky I'm fast. That's Paladon. He's a mean one. Great. Don't you think you should have checked first? Sorry. I thought she'd take decades to make up her mind without prompting. Oh, what a horde. You should have seen it. Follow that horse. I want him back. They sat before Dart's cave, drinking. Where do you even get a whole barrel of wine? Lifted it from a barge up the river. I do that every now and then. I keep a pretty good cellar, if I say so myself. Indeed. Well, we're none the poorer, really. We can drink to that. True, but I've been thinking again. You know, you're a very good actor. Now, supposing, just supposing, you were to travel about good distances from here each time. Scout out villages on the continent and in the isles. Find out which ones are well off and lacking in local heroes. Yes? And let them see that dragon-slaying certificate of yours. Brag a bit, then come back with a list of towns. Maps, too. Go ahead. Find the best spots for a little harmless predation, and choose a good battle site. Rafael? Mm, please, yeah. Here. Thank you. And then you show up, and for a fee... Sixty-forty? That's what I was thinking. But I'll bet you've got the figures transposed. Maybe fifty-five and forty-five, then? Down the middle, and let's drink on it. 
Fair enough. Why haggle? Now I know why I dreamed of fighting a great number of knights, all of them looking like you. <laughs> You're going to make a name for yourself, George. The End I will always be eternally grateful to my Uncle Brian for three things. Teaching me to play chess. Encouraging me to apply to my alma mater, UC Berkeley. Go Bears. And for placing into my teenage hands Zelazny's Nine Princes in Amber. Okay, maybe four things. My love of PDQ Bach is also his fault. Zelazny is a name steeped in rich literary history. His work is cerebral, fantastical, and riddled through with rich veins of humor and tongue-in-cheek social commentary. Take George, for example. St. George is a bit of a big deal here in the UK. Patron saint of the country, the red and white cross of his heraldry forms the national flag, a flag that has been featured prominently in the news lately, alongside the veteran's poppy, as symbols of nationalist, exclusionist pride. How very tongue-in-cheek, then, that St. George's parents were both Greek, born in present-day Turkey and Palestine, and that as a Roman soldier, George, raised a Christian, was martyred for publicly standing up to his commander's order that those of his faith should be arrested and put to death. The whole dragon business is most likely a retelling of the Perseus myth by the early Byzantine church as part of the chivalric romances popular during the Crusades. Think of it as an early PR campaign and one of the longest dragon cons in history, right up Zelazny's alley. Join us next week for The Ulu by Francesca Forrest, narrated by Julia Rios. 150 years ago, in Haven, Kansas, a witch was burned at the stake. This October, in Haven, Kansas, a boy plays a prank on his big sister. Suddenly, crows fill the skies, a female scarecrow plagues the town, and teenagers are dying left and right. There are whispers on the wind. The death toll is rising. Laura Townsend and her family seem to be the center of it all. Will they be able to take the town back from the witch? And can they manage it without losing their lives in the process? Lois Duncan meets Joss Whedon in this literary slasher for the 21st century. Haven, Kansas by Alethea Contis Never reap a harvest sown with blood. Cast of Wonders relies on your donations to pay our authors and to bring you the best in young adult audio fiction week after week. If you've enjoyed this story, please consider making a donation using the PayPal buttons available on our website. Every one time, or even better, a reoccurring monthly subscription can make a huge difference, and you have, as always, our heartfelt thanks. You can share your appreciation for the story by leaving it a review on iTunes, sharing the episode with your family and friends, or discussing it on the EA forum, forum.escapeartists.net, where at Cast of Wonders on Twitter, come say hello. Cast of Wonders is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is brought to you by the creative team of assistant editors Danny Daly and Catherine Inskip, along with our entire group of slush readers. 
Your audio producer is Jeremy Carter, and I remain, as always, your humble editor and host, Marguerite Kenner. Our episodes are released under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. That means you can share the episode, but you can't change it or sell it. Our theme, Appeal to Heavens, is by Alexi Nov from MusicAlley.com. Thanks for listening.